Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Professor Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. This is our course on Substantive Criminal Law. And today we will discuss application of the law and general principles of criminal liability. So students, in the previous lesson we discussed what are the essential ingredients of a crime? And they are human being, actus reus, mens rea and injury. Now moving beyond that, when we talk about criminal law, it is pertinent to understand that law on crimes is divided into essentially two parts. One is the substantive law and the other one is the procedural law. So now what is the difference between substantive law and procedural law? Substantive law on crimes is the Indian Penal Code of 1860 which was drafted by the Britishers and now we have replaced it with the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita of 2023. While the procedural law was earlier the Criminal Procedure Code of 1973 which has now been replaced by the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sahita of 2023. So what in essence is a substantive law? See laws which lay down the rights and duties of individuals are known as substantive laws. So basically a law which lays down the substance of a crime. It tells us what are the essentials that must be present in order to constitute any particular crime. That is what is a substantive law. Whereas what does a procedural law do? It lays down the procedure by which substantive law is to be regulated. See, unless and until we have a strong and a robust procedural system to support our substantive laws, the substantive laws cannot be implemented. Why? Because unless and until there is some fear in the minds of the accused persons, unless and until there is also a confidence in the minds of ordinary citizens that see these are my rights and in case they are, these rights are violated, so there is a mechanism willing to take care of me, willing to take care of my rights to ensure that my rights are not violated and anyone who violates them will be apprehended, prosecuted and duly punished by the long arm of the law. So coming back to the substantive law, it prescribes the definitions of substantive crimes such as what constitutes theft, what constitutes murder, what constitutes forgery and n number of other crimes. See what happens, in crimes we interpret the laws in a very very strict manner. We ordinarily go word by word. And that is why the drafting of substantive law has to be a very, very meticulous exercise. Because see, in criminal law, there is a cardinal principle. Let 99 guilty men go free, one innocent should not be punished. So what does that mean? That we are willing to give the benefit of doubt to an accused person unless all the essential ingredients of the crime have been fulfilled by that accused person and we have established all that in front of a court of competent jurisdiction. So that is why whenever we draft a substantive law, 
each and every essential ingredient of the crime has to be specifically mentioned in case there is any lacuna, any omission. The accused will take advantage of that. And at the same time, unless and until whatever has been laid down by the lawmakers, unless and until each of those ingredients has been satisfied, you cannot deprive a person of his life or personal liberty. And you cannot hold a person guilty of crime. Till the time, the crime, as we discussed in the previous class also, crime is the creation of the state. What does that mean? That what is a crime? It is essentially defined by the state and all the essentials are also essentially determined by the state. So till the time all the essentials are not fulfilled, you cannot hold any person guilty of a crime. And that is why each and every criminal offence has been defined in the minutest of detail so as to avoid any sorts of confusion in the minds of the litigants in the minds of the prosecutors in the mind of the court as well. So substantive law lays down the essential ingredients of every crime and it also provides punishment for the same. See again it is a very very objective thing this application of law because there is no subjectivity involved you cannot say that okay this is a crime that has been committed so maybe this person is deserving of this much of punishment. No. There is an objective yards declared for the same and that has been laid down by the legislators but while awarding that punishment there is a discretion which vests in the judges. Ordinarily what is prescribed is a maximum term of imprisonment and then it is up to the judges if they want they can award a lesser sentence also. But then there are certain crimes which are so grave or heinous in nature that what our legislators do is they prescribe a minimum punishment. What that implies is that if anybody does a crime which is so serious in nature, so that person is not deserving of any sympathy. So what is to be done is in such cases the prescribed minimum has to be necessarily granted and beyond that. It is a discretion of the judge. See if there are any aggravating factors available in that case then in such cases what do the judges do? They have a discretion that if they want they can even award a higher punishment than the prescribed minimum. So now back to the substantive law. So unless all the requirements necessary to constitute a crime under the IPC are fulfilled, no person can be held guilty of a crime and it lays down the conditions that are required for imposition of criminal liability as well as conditions for exemption from criminal liability. So what all has to be proven in order to hold a person guilty of crime? It is there in the statute books. And at the same time, what are those conditions that will entitle an accused to be exempted from criminal liability? Okay. Did he have any justification? See, a person commits a wrong. But does he have any reason for that? Either he should have some sort of a justification or should have some sort of an excuse. Like see, if there is a person of unsound mind, that person of unsound mind hurts another person. Now this person of unsound mind, if you are putting that person on trial, there is a valid excuse in his case and that case is that because that person is suffering from unsoundness of mind, so the person is incapable of understanding either the nature or the consequences of his actions. So even if you are going to punish that person, what is the objective of punishment that would be served in such cases? So that is why that person will not be prosecuted for the crime. Similarly, A stabs B, okay. but what were the reasons why did he stab B? There is a possibility that B was about to shoot him and at the same time because this person had to protect himself so he brought out a knife that he was carrying with him and he stabbed the other person in order to protect himself. So now that is what is exercise of private defense. So although he has committed a harm to the other person but why did he do that harm? Does he have any justification for the same? If the answer is yes, 
that I acted so as to protect myself because state help was not available at that time and had I not acted in my private defense, the other person would have harmed me. Then in such cases what happens? The law will accord this person exemption from criminal liability. So there are so many uh, excuses and justifications which are legally available to an accused person and that has all been provided in the substantive law itself. So if the accused can prove that my case falls under the parameters of any of the excuses or justifications that are available to an accused person under the substantive law, then what happens? This person can be exempted from criminal liability. So that is about substantive law. It lays down the substance of crime. It provides us what is necessary to constitute a crime and at the same time provides what is the punishment that is to be awarded in case any person transgresses the law. Then substantive law also lays down the grounds on which an accused can claim exemption from criminal liability. Now let us understand what is the procedural law. So, section 4.1 of the Criminal Procedure Code 1973, also the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sahita, it lays down that all offences under the Indian Penal Code, which is now the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, shall be investigated, inquired into, tried and otherwise dealt with according to the provisions here and after contained. So what that means is that see all offences that have been laid down under the substantive law whether we are investigating the same, whether the police is conducting investigations, whether those cases are being inquired into or whether the judges they are holding trial in respect of those offences. So what is the step by step guiding procedure? How do they know that? That is known to them because there is a procedural law that has been drafted by our legislators and that is the procedural law of criminal law which needs to be followed by the police, prosecution as well as the judiciary while trying any criminal offence. So whatever is there in the substantive law, in order to give effect to that substantive law, we have a procedural law in place. Then the procedural law it distinctly classifies the offences given under the Indian Penal Code or the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita into cognizable, non-cognizable, bailable, non-bailable, compoundable and non-compoundable offences. Now see every ordinary person, a layman doesn't know what is the difference between a cognizable offence and a non-cognizable offence. See a cognizable offence is a, an offence of a more serious nature in which the police is supposed to act promptly before the accused can run away from the scene or before the accused gets an opportunity to manipulate the evidences or the witnesses and that is why in cognizable offences the investigating police has the power to arrest even without obtaining a warrant from the magistrate because they are so serious in nature. So now what is a cognizable offence? An offence of more serious nature in which police can arrest even without obtaining a warrant. Whereas in non-cognizable offences, because we have to be very mindful that when of the fact that it is an individual's liberty that is at stake. So before arresting a person for a non-cognizable offence, it is mandatory for the police to first go and tell a magistrate that what is the charge that can be put up against that particular accused person and then obtain a warrant from that magistrate so that that person can be arrested by the police. So now what is a cognizable and what is a non-cognizable offence? We have understood more serious, less serious but then again it is not a question of discretion. For any ordinary person, it is again something which the legislators in all of their wisdom, they have drawn a complete list.
that okay this is a crime which is cognizable in nature this is a crime which is non cognizable in nature it is not up to you or i to decide that see this appears to be a more serious kind of a crime so maybe it should come under the category of cognizable offenses no it is again something that the legislators have done and this distinction has been clearly drawn and then there is a list of the offenses of the nature of the offenses similarly coming to bailable or non bailable offenses now bailable offense is something in which bail is a matter of right it cannot be denied to the accused person and non bailable offenses doesn't mean that bail is not to be granted in non bailable offenses bail is a matter of discretion so now the court will decide whether the accused has to be granted bail or he doesn't have to be granted bail so bailable offenses non bailable offenses which offense is bailable and which one is not that is again something which the legislators have already provided there in their list then coming to what are compoundable and non -compoundable compoundable cases so in some cases when a settlement is allowed sometimes with the permission of the court sometimes without the permission of the court that is offenses which are slightly petty in nature and then offenses which are so serious that they have been categorized as non compoundable offenses again you have a comprehensive list which has been provided in the procedural law so how to try any offense how to investigate any offense what is the nature of the offense how do we get to know all this only when we carefully study the procedural law on crimes then the procedural law it also lays down the procedure for registration of criminal cases see a crime has been committed an against a person now what does the person do obviously he has to go and complain but then what is the appropriate authority whom does he need to approach where does he need to go which is the proper police station where the jurisdiction is and what in case the crime has been committed in some other jurisdiction suppose he was on board a train and somebody picked his pocket and he gets off at the other station now the jurisdiction where the pocket was picked has already he has left that behind now where will he go and register his fir now all these things we find answers where under the procedural law on crimes then how does police conduct an investigation again there is a procedure that has been laid down how to conduct inquiries how to conduct criminal trials which is the judge judges court that has the appropriate jurisdiction in a particular case according to the pecuniary value of the matters involved according to the jurisdiction of that particular place so where is the trial to be held how is the trial to be held what are the procedural steps to be followed so we find answers to all this and much more under the procedural law on crimes which is the criminal procedural code and now it is the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita so now after understanding the distinction between substantive and procedural law let us try to understand the background of our substantive law see we all know that we have a substantive criminal law indian penal code that was there since 1860 drafted by the britishers but before that what was the scenario let us talk about that so prior to 1860 there was no uniformity in the indian provincial laws in dealing with criminal matters we had pandits we had qazis why because britishers had the policy of divide and rule so depending upon the religious uh, background of a person that was how criminal matters were also decided so hindus would consult pandits muslims would consult qazis on all legal issues it was all depending on the religion that the parties professed so what happened there was a widespread confusion and uncertainty regarding laws and what happened this led to arbitrary decisions by the courts and there was i mean people were not satisfied also because they were like hey, my religion prescribes a higher punishment the other person's religion prescribes a lesser punishment and then again something which is totally based on the discretion of one person either the pandit or the maulvi is going to decide my fate depending upon what i have done 
there are no uniform laws that have been laid down. So, there is no objectivity involved and people they are not satisfied with this kind of a system. So, because of the uncertainty, because of the confusion, because of the unsatisfactory nature of the uh, dispensation uh, system, in 1833 Lord Maculay moved the House of Commons to codify the entire bulk of criminal law in India. And this led to constitution of the first Indian Law Commission in 1834 because it was realized that see although we can allow people to be regulated in their personal matters by religious laws. See what are personal matters? When we talk about marriage, divorce, maintenance, inheritance, succession, now these are still matters in which it is okay, I, I can be governed by my own religious practices because customs are a very, very integral part of our legal system. But then, when it comes to criminal behavior, that is something, see a person belonging to one particular religion cannot be allowed to get away because maybe his religion allows him to do so. So, when we talk about crimes, crime is something which has to be dealt with by a secular law. The application of criminal laws has to be uniform irrespective of the religion that a person professes. See, there is no religion of a criminal. One who commits a crime has to be punished irrespective of the religion he professes and irrespective of the person of the uh, of the accused's religion, no matter what the religion of the accused was or the religion of the victim was, punishment for the accused should be the same. So, what happened after we got the first law commission? It expired its term, then the second law commission was constituted, but the same members were put in. It was constituted in 1845 and they drafted an exhaustive code. There were a lot of deliberations involved. Once a draft was made, it was revised, re-revised. So, after multiple revisions, finally, we got a bill which they submitted to the Legislative Council in 1856. This bill was passed on 6th October 1860 as the Indian Penal Code 1860 and it became operational from 1st January 1862. From 1862 to 2023, Indian Penal Code was amended multiple times because see, law is meant to serve the interests of the society and the needs of the society they keep on changing. So, to suit the changing times, the changing needs of the society, law had to be revised, amended, updated many times. There were many acts which were earlier considered as crimes which were decriminalized. There were newer categories of crimes that were introduced in the criminal laws and so on and so forth. The law kept on changing. We heard about a major change in the criminal laws in 2013 after the Nirbhaya incident, then again in 2018 after the Kathua and Unnao incident and then finally in 2023 we have now replaced the old law with the new law which is the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. Now this is a new and a progressive law much in to tune with the Indian ethos. So now we have replaced the Indian Penal Code. See when we talk about the title of the old law it was Indian Penal Code. So Penal Code means it is about punishment. It is about penalizing the accused persons and look at the progressive terminology that we have opted for now. Now it is Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. See Indian Penal Code was drafted by our colonial masters, by the Britishers to punish their slaves, to maintain order amongst their slaves. This is a law which has been drafted by a democratically elected government to provide justice to their own people and this is something which is reflected in the title and in the ideology of the law, Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. What we want to do is now provide justice to our people because we are not making any law for any others or any slaves. We are making laws for our own people. See when we go back to the old system, Indian Penal Code, that was about punishing the offender. But does punishment to the offender translate into justice for the victim? The answer is no. 
what does the victim get absolutely nothing in fact witnesses are totally ostracized from the criminal justice system it is only the accused around which the criminal justice hovers so now when we talk about the bharatiya nyay sanhita we are also talking about concepts of restorative justice by introducing newer forms of punishment such as community service so now we have replaced the ipc with the bns so now we will talk about what is the scheme and chapterization of this new law so bharatiya nyay sanhita 2023 is divided into 20 chapters consisting of 358 sections earlier ipc had 511 sections and the arrangement of sections was haphazard see because it was made in 1860 Okay, that was what was required at that time. Now, as per the changing needs of society, and also in view of all the amendments that was carried out from 1860 to 2023, we needed to restructure our laws, and we had to rearrange the sections. So now, all the sections they have been properly arranged into 20 chapters consisting of 358 sections. From 511, we have come down to 358 now. and what are the titles of chapters first one is preliminary which is introduction to the law and about uh, the what is the jurisdiction what is the date of commencement of the law all that has been dealt with under this chapter then coming to punishments okay what is the ideology behind our punishment what are the different kinds of punishments how are those punishments to be administered all that has been given in this chapter then coming to general exceptions okay because there is a separate ch- chapter which has been titled general exceptions and these general exceptions they are available in respect of all the crimes that have been mentioned under the criminal law then coming to abetment that is encouraging instigating anyone to commit a crime there Uh, there is a chapter which deals with abetment criminal conspiracy and attempt so these are inchoate crimes which have all been clubbed together and placed in one single chapter whether we are talking about conspiracy abetment whether we are talking about attempt to commit a crime so these three are now cat- uh, categorized into uh, this inchoate crimes which means incomplete crimes and they have been all placed together unlike in the ipc wherein they were scattered then we have a, sap, a separate chapter dealing with offenses against women and children so that deals with all crimes the kinds of crimes that are committed against women earlier we had 1354 1509 now they have been all very systematically placed in order and put in one single chapter then we have offenses affecting human body there is a separate chapter titled offenses against state the next chapter deals with offenses relating to army navy air force then we have offenses relating to elections then offenses relating to coins currency notes bank notes government stamps offenses against public tranquility anybody committing a riot or an affray creating any kind of an alarm or scare in the society you know all that needs to be taken care of anybody whose acts have the propensity to disturb the peace public tranquility all that have been put together then any offense that has been committed by or which has been committed against a public servant so we they are all dealt with under the chapter offenses by or relating to public servants then contempt of lawful authority of public servants coming to false evidence and offenses against public justice then offenses affecting the public health safety convenience decency and morals that is uh, committing of any obscene acts in public that has all been dealt with under this chapter then offenses relating to religion see we all have a right, right to practice our religion but we have to be mindful of the essential practices of 
other religions also. So, if there is any offense that has the, any act that has the tendency to incite any kind of a hatred or incite any kind of riots based on religion, so that is something again that needs to be controlled. Then there is a separate chapter of on offenses against property, offenses relating to documents and property marks, criminal intimidation, insult, annoyance, defamation, etc. And then the last chapter which is repeal and savings. Coming now to the jurisdiction of Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. So section 1 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita lays down the short title, commencement and application of this law. What it reads is, this act may be called the Bharatiya Nyaya Sanhita. Bharatiya, that is it applies throughout the territory of India. Nyaya, it is indicative of the ideals which is to ensure justice to our people. And Sanhita, that is it has been codified. It shall come into force on such date as the central government may by notification in the official gazette appoint and different dates may be appointed for different provisions of the Sanhita. So this is keeping in mind the requirements of different states and what is the time when we need to introduce the new law. The government will take a call on this that is when it is to be implemented. It has been duly notified but the implementation dates they are to be decided by the state as and when the requirement arises. Every person shall be liable to punishment under this Sanhita and not otherwise for every act or omission contrary to the provisions thereof of which he shall be guilty within India. So now this law is very clear that any person whosoever commits a crime within India shall be punished under this law. So this law shall be governing all people wherever they may be throughout the territory of India. The provisions of the Sanhita shall also apply to any offence that is committed by any citizen of India in any place without and beyond India. So if an Indian commits an act which has been categorized as a crime under the BNS, irrespective of the fact that where this person has committed the crime, but the person is bound by Indian laws and would be punishable under these laws. Any person on any ship or aircraft registered in India, wherever it may be. So if there is any ship, there is any aircraft which is registered within India. Now, no matter where the ship was, no matter where the aircraft was, but then it is subject to the jurisdiction of BNS. Any person in any place without and beyond India committing offence targeting a computer resource located in India. Now, this is a new provision which was introduced to take care of the changing needs of times because technology is evolving and accordingly we are facing newer kinds of crimes every day. So the law has to update itself to deal with newer kinds of challenges. So this law is to be applied to any person in any place without and beyond India. If an offence has been committed targeting a computer resource, we all know there are porous borders now in the cyberspace. Okay, so anybody might be sitting in any part of the world and if they have done something which has targeted a computer resource in India, any harm committed to us, we will take cognizance of the same. So in this section, the word offence includes every act committed outside India, which if committed in India would be punishable under this Sanhita. So what all would constitute an offence? All that has been declared to be an offence and defined so under our codified substantive law, which is the BNS, would be taken care of. There is an illustration. 
A. Who is a citizen of India commits a murder in any place without and beyond India. He can be tried and convicted of murder in any place in India in which he may be found. So what do you understand by this? That is an Indian citizen. Suppose he goes to Uganda. He commits a murder there. The moment he comes back to India, we will arrest him, apprehend him and punish him. Okay. Then nothing in the Sanhita shall affect the provisions of any act for punishing mutiny and desertion of officers, soldiers, sailors or airmen in the service of government of India or the provisions of any special or local law. Special laws, they are applicable on specific special matters. Local laws, they have their own jurisdictional uh, areas within which they are functional. So, BNS would not be applying to them and BNS would also not apply to uh, uh, offenses which are committed by soldiers, sailors, airmen. Why? Because they are governed by their respective army law, navy law, air force law. So now let us talk about the jurisdiction of BNS in detail. So as you can see on the screen, jurisdiction is broadly divided into three kinds of jurisdiction. One is territorial, the other one is extraterritorial and the third kind of jurisdiction is admiralty jurisdiction. So we will now discuss each of these jurisdictions in detail. First, territorial jurisdiction. The authority of a state to exercise its jurisdiction within its territory is undisputed. According to Section 1, Clause 3 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, every person shall be liable to punishment under this Sahita and not otherwise for every act or omission contrary to the provisions thereof of which he shall be guilty within India. So, if a person does any act that he has been forbidden from doing under this act, or if a person omits to fulfill any legal obligation or omits to do a legal duty that has been enjoined upon him under this law, then such a person would be held guilty under this law. Thus, any person found guilty of commission of an offence within the territory of India shall be held liable for the same irrespective of his rank irrespective of his nationality, caste or creed. So you see here, this is a law which will be uniformly applicable to anyone who commits an offence within the territory of India. So even if it is a foreigner, see irrespective of the nationality of a person, if somebody does an act in our territory and that is an act which has been declared under the BNS to be a criminal act, then irrespective of the rank that a person has, irrespective of the nationality of that person, irrespective of the religion, caste or creed, that person would be subjected to our territorial jurisdiction and would be tried as per the laws of our land. According to section 2, Clause 26 of Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, the word person includes any company or association or body of persons whether incorporated or not. However, it is not possible to convict a corporation or a company which is a non-judicial person for crimes such as culpable homicides, extortion, causing grievous hurt etc. See, why is it impossible to convict them? Because they are not natural persons. So, how can you convict a company for murdering a person? So, when we talk about crimes such as culpable homicide extortion causing grievous hurt for which punishment is imprisonment or death penalty but they can be held liable for offences punishable with fine because you can impose liability of fine upon a company, you can penalize them. But how is that penalty to be given? In the form of a fine. You cannot imprison the company as it is. The provisions 
of Bharatiya Nyay Sahita are applicable to foreign nationals too. Thus, if any foreign national commits an act which amounts to an offence under the provisions of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita and if such an offence is committed within the territory of India, the person would be subject to the jurisdiction of Indian criminal courts irrespective of whether the act complained of is recognized as an offence in his country or not. Suppose A, an American national comes to India, he does an act something which India recognizes as a crime. Now, that act might not be recognized as a crime in his own country. Okay. But since he has committed an act which we don't permit to be done, which is a crime in our country, so we have a right to prosecute that person. Our jurisdiction will apply to him, territorial jurisdiction. Any crime that is committed within the territory of India, that is subject to our jurisdiction. But then there are some people who have been exempted from liability under the BNS. Who are those people? The President of India, the Governors of States. Now these are people who enjoy total exemption from the jurisdiction of criminal courts by virtue of Article 361 of the Constitution of India. International laws, they extend this immunity to certain other persons also such as foreign sovereigns, ambassadors, alien enemies, members of foreign army and crew on border warships. Now these persons are immune from the jurisdiction of criminal courts and they are to be tried in their own countries for offences that are committed by them on foreign territories because their law is protecting them. They are subjected to their own jurisdiction. The moment they go back, they could be tried by their own country. But they are immune from jurisdiction of the other countries. Then foreign diplomats, they are representatives of their countries and that is why they are granted certain privileges and immunities. Now, why are they granted these privileges and immunities? This is to ensure that they may effectively carry out their duties in accordance with the provisions of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961. So, for the diplomats, their consulate premises are regarded as extensions of their country's territory within which the territorial laws of the receiving country have no jurisdiction. So, a consulate within Delhi of another country, the premises of that consulate is an extension of their own country. So, they are immune from the jurisdiction of our country within the premises of their own consulate. <coughs> Why? Because their own laws are governing them within those premises. However, Sometimes the official's home country may wave off this immunity. When can this happen? When the individual abuses his official position or when he does some act which amounts to a serious offence and is totally unrelated to his duties as such diplomat. See what is the objective behind granting these diplomatic immunity to these people? The purpose is that they are representatives of their country, they have been sent on a mission here, they have certain uh, jobs to accomplish. So they have been given this immunity so that they can further what their country wants them to do. But then that does not mean that they commit any such act which damages the security or which is a serious offence within the country in which they are based. So, if they indulge in such illegal, such criminal acts, so their country is also not going to shield them and they can wave off these kind of uh, immunity in serious offences. Next, we will talk about extraterritorial jurisdiction. In our constitutional scheme, all laws made by parliament primarily are applicable only within the country. 
Ordinarily, therefore, all persons who commit a crime in India can be tried in any place where the offence is committed. Section 1, Clause 4 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, however, extends the scope of applicability of the territorial jurisdiction of Indian courts to try cases where cause of action took place outside the geographical limits of India. What does section 1 clause 4 say? It reads, any person liable by any law for the time being in force in India to be tried for an offence committed beyond India shall be dealt with according to the provisions of this Sahita for any act committed beyond India in the same manner as if such act had been committed within India. So, the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the IPC and now BNS, it extends to offences committed outside the territory of India, whether a person has committed such an act on any foreign land, committed on ships, on high seas or aircrafts which are outside its sovereign airspace provided. The offences are committed by citizens of India. Okay, so, a citizen of India going anywhere in the world and committing a crime is liable to the jurisdiction of Indian courts. So, that is the reason. See, many times we have these cases in foreign courts wherein people, they go and they seek asylum from that country. So, people who are illegal uh, immigrants sometimes or people who have taken the wrong route to reach into any other country or who want to overstay in the foreign country uh, beyond the uh, limit of their visa. So, then they resort to such tactics. They commit some uh, offense which is a crime in India but which may not be a crime in that country and then they go and appeal before the courts that if you send us back to India because once they overstay their limit or once it is found that they are staying in our country illegally what do those people they do? They try to send those people back to India. So, then people they resort to such tactics, they will commit a crime and then they will say that please do not send us back to India because we will be subject to uh, being tried in a criminal court and we will be punished. So, see this is an act which is not a crime in your country but which is a crime in that country. So, they try to paint us in a negative light that is if they will be sent back to India. So, we will be punishing them which will be a violation of their legal right. So, these people they try to resort to such claims. There was a case in which an Indian national, he went abroad uh, to Hong Kong and when his visa expired, he got into a relationship with a married woman there and then he said that when he was to be deported back to India, he took the plea that see if I am sent back to India, I will be tried for adultery and I will be put behind the bars whereas I have committed this act on your soil and it is not a crime here, so please grant me asylum. So, these are the kind of tactics that people resort to because if it is a crime here, the moment the person lands in India, we have a jurisdiction to try him. Okay? If the person, if the one whose rights have been violated, if that person complains, we have a right to try the accused person because that is adultery is a crime of a different nature. There are certain crimes of which we do not need anyone to come and complain. The state can of itself take its cognizance of such serious crimes also. So, that is how extraterritorial jurisdiction it applies. So, if an offence is committed by a citizen of India or if it is committed on board ships or aircrafts that are registered in India. See, if a ship is registered in India, and if a crime is committed on that ship, even when it is on high seas, still we have our jurisdiction because the ship is essentially registered in India. So, our jurisdiction extends to that ship, no matter where it might be in the entire world. Then, if it, an offence is committed by any person who is a citizen or who is not even a citizen, but if it is committed at any place, whether it is committed within India or outside India, but 
the crime has targeted a computer resource and that computer resource is located in India, then again we have a jurisdiction to deal with such crimes. Then coming to the admiralty jurisdiction. So, first we talk about the territorial jurisdiction, then the extraterritorial jurisdiction, now coming to the admiralty jurisdiction. So, what is admiralty jurisdiction? Admiralty jurisdiction refers to jurisdiction over maritime affairs, both civil as well as criminal in nature. Thus, admiralty jurisdiction refers to trial of maritime causes in accordance with the maritime laws. This is to be exercised while trying offences that are committed on board vessels, on the high seas, which are traditionally viewed as no man's land. So, the vessel is treated as an extension of the territory of the country whose flag it bears and it is subjected to the laws of that country. So, what that implies is just because a ship is on high seas, it does not give a license to anyone and everyone to commit crimes there. Okay? It does not mean that because it is in no man's land, so there is no law applicable to that ship there. The ship is very much bound by the laws of the flag of the country whose flag it bears. So, those laws would be applicable. The ship would be deemed to be an extension of the country whose flag it bears. Then section 208 of the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita, which is the procedural counterpart of section 1 clause 4 of Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, authorizes prosecution in accordance with the provisions of the BNSS with the prior sanction of the central government for offences that are committed by citizens of India on the high seas or by non-citizens of India on ships or aircrafts that are registered in India. See, any offence that is committed even beyond our airspace, even beyond our territorial waters, provided the ship or aircraft is registered in India, so we have a jurisdiction over that. So, Indian criminal courts, they can exercise admiralty jurisdiction over offences committed on board Indian ships on the high seas, whether committed by Indian nationals or by persons of foreign origin. It would extend over Indian ships in some other nation's territorial waters, though that nation may also invoke and exercise their concurrent jurisdiction. See what happens? A ship bearing India's flag, it is in territorial waters of say America. Now, when it is in their territorial waters, their territorial jurisdiction extends over that ship. But because that ship is registered in India, it is an extension of our territory no matter where it goes. So, they also exercise their, their jurisdiction and we also exercise our jurisdiction over that ship. So, any crime that is committed over that particular ship, it would be covered under both those laws. So, that is what is known as concurrent jurisdiction. Thereafter, Indian criminal courts can exercise admiralty jurisdiction over that are committed by over offences that are committed on ships bearing foreign flags within the territorial waters of India. So, any ship say bearing an Australian flag, a Danish flag, a crime is committed on board that ship while it is in our territorial waters. Now, we also have a jurisdiction. We can very well arrest those people of committing a crime even though they are bearing their own flag. Again, this is an incidence of what we call as the concurrent jurisdiction and acts of piracy. Acts of piracy are something where no matter where they are committed, we have the right to control such acts and to take actions against pirates. Then personal jurisdiction. So, the personal jurisdiction of the Indian Penal Code, now the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, it extends to cover all citizens of India guilty of committing an offence whether inside or outside the territory of India. The crucial test for determination of personal jurisdiction is citizenship at the time of the commission of the offence. So, what is the determining factor? 
that what was the citizenship that you were holding at the time when you committed the offence. If you are in any other foreign country, but at the time when you commit a crime in that foreign country, if you are a citizen of India, we will govern you. If you have already relinquished your citizenship here, you have taken citizenship of the other country, then you will be governed by the laws of that particular country. But till the time you continue to be our citizen, our laws will govern you. So, citizenship that is acquired after the commission of the crime will not make the person liable under Indian law. So, when he committed the crime, that is the crucial time. So, if he commits a crime somewhere, after that he comes to India and he acquires Indian citizenship. So, now we will not apply the law retrospectively to cover those persons who were not Indian citizens at the time when they committed a crime. So, our laws will apply to a person who is a citizen of our country when he does something against our laws. Similarly, citizenship relinquished subsequent to commission of offence will not exempt him from prosecution under Indian laws. An Indian going abroad committing a crime something which we treat as a crime, they might not be treating that as a crime, but which is a crime as per our Indian laws. Now that person goes there commits a crime. Subsequently, he relinquishes Indian citizenship. He takes up the citizen of citizenship of that foreign country. Now that does not mean that he is not liable under our laws. As long as he was our citizen, we have jurisdiction over him. If he subsequently relinquishes his citizenship, so the acts that he commits after relinquishing our citizenship, we have no say over that. But till the time he was our citizenship, he has to abide by our laws. Then all foreign nationals who are guilty of committing an offence within the territory of India. So, this also covers foreign nationals who commit offences in India while being physically present in some other country. Okay. So, committing offence in India, targeting a computer resource in India, cheating an Indian national, an Indian in India, the person he is committing cheating over the phone or over the internet against an Indian citizen who is based in India. Again, that is a crime, we will hold the person liable. A foreign national coming on our land, committing an act which is dealt with as a crime under our laws, we will hold that person guilty, irrespective of the fact that it might not be a crime on his territory. But if it is a crime on our territory, he has to abide by our laws. Irrespective of the fact that he says that I was not aware that this is a law, uh, there is a law which prohibits this act in your country. See. Ignorance of law is no excuse. Although it is practically impossible for anyone to know all the laws, but once you are in the Indian territory, you are bound by the Indian laws, whether you have an opportunity to know the laws or not. But if you do something which is a crime on Indian territory, you will be held guilty of the same. So, section 1, clause 5, sub clause C makes the provisions of Indian Penal Code applicable to offences committed by any person in any place targeting a computer resource in India. Cyberspace transcends national boundaries and in such cases it would be difficult to determine jurisdiction if we did not have express provisions in this regard and we cannot allow criminals to take advantage of confusion relating to jurisdiction. So, all persons citizens as well as non-citizens, they will be held guilty for crimes who are that are committed by them on board any ship or aircraft registered in India wherever such vessel or aircraft may be at the time of commission of such crime. A ship bearing an Indian flag on the high seas, you might be an Indian citizen serving on board that ship, you might be a foreign national on board that ship. Any act committed on board that ship which amounts to a crime as per the Indian laws, the person whether he is an Indian national or a foreign national would be subject to the jurisdiction of our laws. But the BNS is not applicable to people over him the Army Act, the Navy Act, Indian Air Force Act applies, then special laws that are laws dealing with a special subject and local laws, that laws which apply only in a particular part of the country. 
So students, in this lesson, we discussed the jurisdiction of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. That is, it has a territorial jurisdiction and extraterritorial jurisdiction and admiralty jurisdiction and also a personal jurisdiction. Then we also discussed the exceptions to applicability of our substantive law on crimes. So, this will be all for this session. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you.